Welcome back to the Blue School Spaces podcast. Today, I have the privilege of sitting down with multi Grammy award winning mastering engineer Alan Douches. Alan has mastered some of my favorite albums of all time, such as Michigan and Illinois by Sufjan Stevens, LCD Sound Systems, self titled album, and thousands and thousands of other records that we all know and love. Today, we talked about what sample rates should we be using in our DAWs for the highest quality? What approaches can we take to our songwriting so that we have a unique, original, and authentic sound of our own? And how important is gear in the hierarchy of importance in our music making process, amongst many other things? So there's truly something in here for everyone, whether you're an artist, a mixing engineer, a producer, or just someone who's interested in nerding out about music. There's something of practical, applicable value in here for you. And thank you so much for tuning in. Without further ado, let's dive into this interview with Alan Douches. What's going on, Alan? <laughs> hey! Hey! How are you? I'm doing really well, man. I'm really excited and uh, grateful that you've taken the time to sit down and chat with me for a second. All good. I was doing a bit of research on you um, in the last day or two and and saw that um, one of the things that is noted is that you have mastered over 16,000 albums. Is yeah, that accurate? I, I, uh, I, the office um, at some point started keeping vague track track of it you know but that's kind of you know i mean that's kind of the gig with a mastering engineer you're you know you're working on a lot of projects so if you stay stay busy the numbers just tur- keep churning up you know so wow yeah. that's unreal and i remember every single one of them <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I was uh, I was looking at your your credits online, and it's just like this endless page of scrolling through decades of different records. And I would stop and find my favorite ones. Like, oh my god, he did LCD Sound System. He did Sufjan. He did Juju, and like all of these uh, Cannibal Corpse. Uh, all sorts of interesting. Yeah, we yeah. we have a little. Uh, it's it, I guess it's a little ongoing. Um, you know joke around here or something is that we're like sometimes in attended um we, we you know it's various parts around the studio we have lots of you know records on the wall different things and whatever and so you know if it's a if it's a metal band coming in and they'll they're looking at you know sufjan lcd you know whatever ben folds the you know wow who does all those records you know and i'm like oh yes yeah, the guy that comes in at night you know he just does that stuff you know and but if it's like, you know, an anti-folk somebody or, you know, an alternative band and they see the Misfits or, you know, Sepultura or whatever, they're like, ah, yeah, that's the guy that comes in at night, you know? Nice. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, to me, it's just all good. Yeah, I mean, I love all of the different genres we always have. Um, you know, we certainly, you know, have our um, couple of niches that we fall into pretty easily. Mm. But, you know, like we really don't do a whole lot of like mainstream like hip hop, um, mm. you know, we do some, you know, industrial stuff, um, and maybe some old school stuff, but not really the pop, you know, kind of hip hop stuff or so mm. or R and B. But although I do have, you know, I think I think we actually, I think the other day we were talking about the fact that like I was a staff engineer at Sugar Hill Records, so wow. I kind of have that old school. Uh, you know, rap and R and B, you know, in my back pocket if I have to pull it out for somebody. So that's incredible. I'm very curious because when I was reading through your various credits, uh, one thing I noticed was that you're listed as an uh, as an engineer on LCD Sound Systems' self titled album, and I was going to ask you if that is accurate or if that website. Well, it. On it. There were th- quite a few artists um, where, again, you know, when you talk about stems and things like that, um, with uh, with some of the early LCD stuff, James b- would bring in a lot of gear 
and would bring in stems and maybe even multi tracks. Mm. And, you know, and we would try things. I remember one time he was, he, he just got his hands on, I think it was a Trident EQ or something. And he, and he brought it in and we were, you know, a being it with other stuff. So yeah, it does go a little deeper with some artists, Mm. but I think that, that, that was early on. And also it happens with artists that I've had, you know, multiple albums of work with and that maybe they're changing or they couldn't get their producer or they couldn't get someone. So they'll ask us to get a little bit more involved in, in the record. I mean, I think just about every mastering engineer now will listen to mixes ahead of time, you know, Mm. like definitely send, send the mixes ahead of time. Let's make sure everything is right. You know, I I think we are probably, you know, you know, making a comment about a mix that might be best to be adjusted in a mixing situation, you know, on 50% of the things that we hear, Mm. you know, and so like, it's better to solve it in the mix. Mm. So having, yeah, again, having that a little bit of that background and sometimes we'll get on the phone or a zoom with them and uh you know and say you know well listen you know your vocals just riding a little high yeah i couldn't get it to blend right well you know have you tried any you know side chain compression on an instrumental group or you know or you know the snares and just not cutting through well have you tried some parallel c- compression it feels like you're clamping it down quite a bit you know so it's being able to talk on those terms with the artists um you know is easy so, you know, I mean, I don't know that that's also that rare. I mean, it was rare back, you know, years ago, I guess, for mastering engineers. But now so many people have mastering plugins that, you know, every studio offers mastering as an option to their to their, you know, artists or their clients. So it's really just a matter of how far you want to take it, you know. Mm. Yeah, I totally hear that. That's so exciting too. I'm sure for, uh, I know for myself, I'll speak for myself. I was going to say for a lot of people listening as well, just the idea of you being in the studio with a James Murphy, with the Sufjan, with the, the endless amount of other artists that you've worked with is, um, is really exciting. And it's just, it's wild to, to feel like, whoa, the guy who, worked on my favorite track was like in the room with you and then it's like also you being such a big part of what makes that sound so great as well and and i'm honored to have to be sitting in the track in this seat you know it's not Mm. like we you know we we don't take it lightly obviously Mm. um and we you know we embrace you know we're rolling up our sleeves and and getting into the nitty-gritty with them you know, mm. because after all, it you know, it doesn't matter how you get to the end result, but you want to get to the end result and it to be awesome no matter what. Mm. You know, um, there's many times where, you know, we'll not necessarily reject mixes, but we'll we'll send them back and say, listen, you know, this needs some work. You know, mm. you know, you really need to, you know, get on this or we'll suggest maybe a mixing engineer, mm. you know. I mean, we do have other engineers here. I'm uh, these days. I'm about the only mastering engineer here. Mm. Uh, although a couple of the other guys do, you know, uh, their own projects or the, some of their own clients with that. But um, I like I like just I, I guess I probably maybe mix several albums a year still, and that's more just because it's fun, and mm. also just to stay involved in it. You know, to like you know to really stay in in touch with what you guys are trying to do in the you know in the field in the studios Mm. you know like i used to be a big proponent of like mixing all analog you know we you know we have an analog mixing room and and we used to let people come in and just you know pull up either a two-inch tape or their pro tool session or something and just try to mix it in analog and and you know get the response from them like oh wow it's just it's so much easier to get a blend or whatever that might be but whether that's true or not and whether you have that as an option or not most people don't so it's like all right let's start let's start mixing in the box here a bit you know let's start seeing what everybody's kind of up against and and to a certain degree let's not you know go online and watch how everybody's doing it let's let's formulate how we would do it 
mm. and, and, and kind of come up with our own solutions. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you say in the all analog world, one of the responses you get is it blends so well, because I noticed that me having a setup that is entirely in the box when it comes to mixing, um, I noticed that when I'm mixing a record or sometimes I master my own records in the box as well, I find that I'm fighting the sound of the plugins often. Like right. they'll add something that I like, but also something that I don't like. And I, right. I'm not really able to, no matter where I boost or cut or compress or set the settings, it's like, it's, it's not quite natural or musical. It has this sort of, offness to it right right and yeah i'm curious um what your what your take on the plug-in generation of mixing is versus analog and how you navigate using plugins such that you're not fighting the sound that they impose well i guess you know historically speaking you know i started off for the first three years of my engineering career right out of high school um working on a neve console a neve 8038 mm -hmm. so like i learned on one of the greatest mixing boards ever made you know specifically you know discrete designs and stuff and mm -hmm. and that became my standard but it had an an antiquated knee cam system on it you know, the neve's automation moving faders flying faders mm -hmm. that really never worked so you really had to be just all hands on deck right you had to have like you know two assistants the artist and everybody's got a knob and a job to do in the mix right mm -hmm. uh when i left that studio i um i went to sugar hill and they had a sony i uh, know a um mci 636 which was one of the first kind of like you know high tech in line, lots of channels, lots of routing options, boards, mm -hmm. and it had tape based automation and it worked the automation. Mm -hmm. So what happened was it was like my mixes got better because I had an automation system that worked, mm. even though the Neve console absolutely blew the doors off of the sound of the MCI console. Mm. The fact that we didn't have automation made it really difficult to have awesome mixes. Mm. Whereas on the 630, uh, 636, it, you could spend lots of time trying to perfect that mix, making those moves just right to get those balances right. So with that in mind, I've kind of always proceeded like, well, yeah, it's great to have the Neve console. And nowadays, you know, obviously you have far better technology in the analog world to be able to do automation and recalls. But um, I think when it comes to the plug-in world, it's kind of like if you can make the source better, if you can make the inspiration better, if you can, you know, better fine tune that vision of what that song is because you're, you know, abusing plugins or you're distort whatever it is you're doing, then that's awesome. Mm. Then great. Congratulations, you know, just you're, you're right that there are some just like an analog, there are limitations, right? Recording to tape, you know, you've got, you know, a signal to noise ratio of 70 dB plus or minus three or four, depending upon your tape machine, your alignments, et cetera, and so forth. So, you know, you have to work with that medium and you have to get a good signal, you know, slamming it's fun, but if you slam it too hard, you're, you're stuck with it. Right. Mm. So you had to work with it and same thing in digital. I mean, yeah, the, the, there are limitations I feel many people feel about mixing. I think that's why summing in the analog world is still, at the moment kind of popular because it allows you to have the total recall but allows you know the delicate summing of everything some mm -hmm. people say that you know that they don't hear it well it doesn't to my mind it doesn't really matter you know we you know we try to just say are you happy you know mm -hmm. is, are you coming up with the right result i mean mm -hmm. when you when you think about sufyan's um illinois record mm -hmm. it was recorded in a digio one <laughs> You know, mm. I mean, in the basic tracks were started on a Roland 16 track, you know, standalone uh, recording 
desk, you know, mixing board and, and hard drive, you know, f- which were not the state of the art at the time. Mm-hmm. And even as you listen to the record today, especially the vinyl, it's like, it sounds amazing. So the, the limitation of the digital really, you know, was there, but he had, he had his workarounds, which mostly were getting the sounds at the sources, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I really like to cater these discussions that I have with experienced uh, music personnel uh, to people that are sort of like the bedroom producer type, because that right. is what I am. And like, I want to sort of help my peers as much as possible. And um, I'm curious for someone who is working in the box and wants to get as much of a natural, good sounding mix as possible, what would you recommend? Like, I know you've said don't overuse plugins. Yeah, that's like, I preach that. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of like if you, you know, it's, it's a very popular, you know, like you'll pop open a session and you'll see that, you know, they're boosting, you know, four bands of EQ, you know, when in fact you could just take one band down, right, and mm. and achieve kind of the similar thing, um, you know, do it do external processing. As you know, we you know we do that a lot here. We recommend it to a lot of people. A lot of you know the producers that I that we work with, even the home guys, like you know, um, you know, don't use the plugins. Try try going outside the box for them. You know, I think the originally the thought process was once you go in digital, don't come back out right but i think the conversion process that uh, you know the the d to a coming back out and then the add going back in has gotten so much better than it was when people were saying that mm. that i think it's a it's an equal trade-off now it's like if you can take it out to a guitar stomp box or something and get a better you know, distortion, fuzz tone effect than you can with the amp simulator or something, or at least one that you like better or that's more defined as your sound, mm. then it's, then absolutely go for it, you know. Mm. I, 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 there's a, there was a, there was a project that I did, um, I want to say maybe about seven or eight years ago, where the guy was recording it at Iwi Studios in New Jersey. It was in Hoboken. I guess it was Hoboken or Weehawken. Um, and um, they had the Focusrite analog console there, but he <laughs> recorded it all digital and mixed it digital in his computer. And, you know, and he had so many plugins on it that, you know, and it was one of those sessions where we couldn't, you know, he just showed up with the mixes. And so, you know, okay, let's get started. You know, like if he had, if he had sent the mixes ahead of time and we would have had an opportunity to, you know, review the mixes and maybe said to him like, wow, you know, really kind of squashing these mixes kind of, you know, it not really hearing much resolution on them, you know, um, you know, maybe we could have gotten a little bit further during the, the, the actual attended session, mm-hmm. but, um, I think I remembered measuring because he had so many plugins in that had like the analog button or something patched in that when the session was open, but not playing, there was only, it was, I think I want to say, I remember that there was 27 dB of dynamic range. So that the noise floor in 24 bits was like over a hundred. I forget what it was, but I remember measuring it and thinking like, this is insane. <laughs> like that, that there's this much noise just being mm. generated by the plugins because, and, and a lot, it was like, I'm, I don't want to maybe assume that I know what brand it was, but I think I do, but it was just, you know, all of these, you know, analog effect buttons, you know, and basically all it was doing was adding noise, which was just completely clouding the mix. Right. So, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah. I, I realized that about a year ago that the analog 
on switch on so many plugins that are popular today is literally just noise i was right. like i was like oh it must add vibe or something and right. i even right. tricked myself into hearing like oh i like it better when it's on but then right. i realized it was just noise and um yeah those stay off always now <laughs> well i mean you know they can be useful in recreating you know a retro sound or something and and you know in in a little bit of taste, but I think a lot of times it's that accumulation of all those subtleties that people aren't aware of, mm -hmm. you know, they're, um, you know, they're putting the plug in on with the analog effect and there's something about it. They're liking and that's great, but they keep doing it and they're not realizing what that's doing to the overall. Right. So one thing I was really curious to ask you was when we spoke on the phone, you mentioned, something along the lines of every plugin you add reduces the resolution by one bit or something like that well what 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 i think what i was talking about was that uh you lose the authenticity of the original source uh. you know um where you know obviously no matter what you do one of the questions we usually hit our, our interns with is what is distortion you know uh, and, you know, the answer that we want them to say is any deviation whatsoever from the source signal, you know, so, mm -hmm. so even if you're using a gain stage, either any in analog or digital or anything, you're, you're distorting it, right? I mean, you're changing the sound, you're distorting the sound. So there's an important, you know, uh, distinction between whether you're changing something or not like is the bypass really a bypass or does it leave a high pass filter plugged in so that if you automate the bypass switch it doesn't click right or something mm. you know as, as it's loading buffs you know audio to the buffer stages to do the processing and then you have wow. the, you know yeah so there's there's a lot to be said about how authentic is the sound and and that's what I think people don't realize is that you start losing. You might like it better. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that it's always going to be worse. Mm. But you do. If if you track something and you liked the sound, the more plugins you add to it, the the further from the original source, obviously you're going to get. And so that resolution drifts from this original authentic source to something new. You know, mm. and that if that if that if you're liking it better, that's awesome. Most of the time, I think people just get lost in that that scenario where you, you've kind of gone so far with all of the plugins that the original sources aren't there. I mean, I'm most I think most mixing engineers will tell the stories of like they'll get the multi-track sessions from an artist from a band or something. And they're about to start to mix and they open the session and there's, you know, there's a peak limiter on every track, you know, mm. or, you know, and or, you know, there's, you know, a five band EQ on, even though maybe it's not doing anything, all the bands are on and they're processing and, and changing the waveform and losing some of that authentic detail that was there. Mm. So I, I kind of feel like that, that's a big problem. Too, mm. is that you know people are forgetting what their source was like why did you choose that instrument you know can you go back to it and say you know what i i you know we yeah we we love that microphone we love the sound why are we not embracing that mm. right yeah and on that note i'm really curious i've also heard you talk about uh the idea that people working in a digital environment should embrace the main advantage, which is the dynamic range that one can achieve in that environment. Yeah. And uh, you've spoken about, you know, playing with composing and mixing in a 88.2 or 96 kilohertz environment. And I wanted to ask you with that, since so much music is being standardized at 44.1, um, does it make more sense to record at 88.2 so that the the down sampling to 44.1 is exactly half or does that matter? I don't think it matters as much. Um, mm. I think there's a, there are a lot of guys that have a preference for that, especially mm. if you stay in the box. Um, mm. You know, I think most uh you know dare i dare, dare i call us like professional mastering engineers you know mm. you know we're going to take it out into the analog world anyway 
Yeah. You know, and so we're going to, no matter what sample rate you choose, we're going to take it into the analog world and then choose what target source sample rate we want to come back in at. You know, if we happen to know that it's just meant for, you know, uh, a certain level and we only want to do, you know, 24 bit 44 one sample back in, then there's no sample rate being used whatsoever. So that's the cleanest way to do it. I, I think I would just suggest everybody to record at 88 or 96. Absolutely. The, you know, the, and I think what happens with a lot of people is that they'll, they'll record one track or two tracks, you know, at a higher sample rate and say, I don't hear the difference, you know, and of course you don't hear the difference because nobody's got hearing that goes up to, you know, 40 kilohertz or something, but it's more in the interaction in the mixing stages or in your plug-in world where there's just far more places to help create a smoother, you know, clearer mix, clearer processing at the higher sample rates. You know, mm. they, it, it, it just, in my opinion, and I think most people that have been through it will say it's just it just it just sounds better. Even if you're talking about getting a grimy, you know, grungy, distorted sound, if there's just more places to create that harmonic content within the box, and it's worth it. But not at the cost of you know, like if. There's a lot of guys that would be like, yeah, you know, I want to rec record at 88 or 96, but quite frankly, my dog can't handle it. You know, I, by the time I load all my plugins in, you know, or whatever, it's like, I, I don't have enough, you know, and I have, to, so halfway through a mix or something, I've got to, you know, change the sample rate or I've got to downsample it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, the production values and the, whatever you're doing, your arrangement, you know, kind of are the most important thing. I almost mm. said Trump's everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want to go there. Um, so you know, um, you know. So you you've got to remember that. And there are guys that mix at forty four because that's what they've got. You know, mm. they could, they may have processors that only work at forty four or forty eight. So, and if that's an important part of your production process, great. But I don't know anybody that I've worked with that I've asked to go to ninety six or eighty eight that doesn't admit that ultimately it will sound better, mm. you know? And it's a, it is also, it's an advancing world. You know, I mm. mean, Apple has come out and um, is introducing, you know, spatial audio, but also high resolution streaming. Mm. Uh, Amazon is promising it. I haven't really heard it on Amazon yet. Mm. Uh, Spotify said that they're gonna follow, I think towards the end of the summer or something like that. Mm. So Tidal's been doing it for a long time. You know, so, so why not, if you can, if you, if your dog can handle it, why not work at the higher sample rates? It just doesn't, you know, before mm. it used to take up more hard drive space, the CPUs couldn't keep up to it. The systems would crash all, all valid points, get mm. through the production, pick a format, get to work, make your song work, make your production work. The sample rate is not going to make a better song, <laughs> you know, mm. But it's certainly about those accumulating subtleties aspect mm. that if it if there is more space, like, like we're talking about, that it's hard to get those faders to feel like they're in a comfortable place at 44. At 96, it just gets easier. You know, in analog, it maybe it's even easier, mm. you know, but it's, you know, the excuse can't be that, oh, I don't have any hard drive space anymore. No, no, that's not working, guys. You know, mm. come on. Right. Yeah, I really resonated with your your mantra, pick a format and get to work. Um, because I'm someone who has obsessed over gear and which DAW the, has the best sound, if that's even a real thing. And um, I'll find myself on a f on forums for like two weeks researching what the best <laughs> strat is for a strat tone or DAW is for mixing or whatever and in the meantime I notice the people who are thinking less and acting more 
are blowing past me while I'm like <laughs> struggling to find the answer to yeah. a most irrelevant question. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I'm, I'm curious, like what prompted that saying for you, how you came to that, were you seeing a lot of people struggling with that same phenomenon? Oh yeah. I mean, and, and I, I, I still see it in terms of, you know, microphone choice or, mm. you know, or, you know, what, what, yeah, what thought is, you know, and, and yeah, things have sounds and things, you know, certainly will affect the sound, but again, none of that is as important as, you know, I, I have a pecking order. It's, you know, it's singer, lyric, melody, groove, gear, you know, at most important is the singer. And then it's, you know, and then it's the lyric and then it's the melody and then it's the groove and then it's the gear, you know, mm. like, you know, a, yeah, a snare, an awesome snare jump sound will make, you know, an engineer take notice, but most people don't really care, you know, mm. but, you know, you, but there's a reason why we care about a great snare drum sound or a guitar sound or whatever, because it drives the passion. It drives us to want things to be more awesome. Mm. So I'm always in favor of it, but not at the case of, yeah, getting yourself tied in. There's, I know that there's, um, there's a lot of philosophies about like the option paralysis, I think is uh, Dillinger escape plan says, uh, and, or, you know, just getting your mind can't process to, you know, too many options. I think it's mm. 27. It stops at that or something like that, you know, and, um, so the more options you have, the less artistic you're going to be, mm. you know, and, and that, you know, in, you know, in the cases, uh, you know, again, like, you know, it's easy to, to name some classic records, but they are, they are classic and they, they exemplify this kind of situation, you mm. know, Sufjan with Illinois, with Illinois, it was like, he didn't have a whole lot of options, you know, had a couple of microphones, had the Digio one as his main source. And if you, you know, if you go to the following record that he released, which was um, Avalanche, which were all the outtakes from Illinois, that mm. you see like, oh, well, he just started again. He wasn't happy with where it was. He just re-recorded it rather than searched through 40 different plugins or kept changing microphones, you know, um, mm. I, somebody called me once, this was many years ago. Uh, I think it was about 20 years ago or so somebody called me from LA and a friend of mine and he's like, he said, Alan, how long should it take to get a vocal sound? And, uh, and I, I remembered that they were recording to one inch 16 track. So it was analog. And I, I said something to the effect of like, well, you know, the engineer should probably have a couple of microphones up, you know, and, and probably as you're singing along, you know, you should probably, you know, be moving from one mic to another, maybe, you know, and maybe just taking a pass to choose a microphone and then maybe, you know, another half of a pass to get, you know, the, the mic pre and or some compression set. You know, so I don't know, you know, five, eight, five, eight, 10 minutes, something like that. <laughs> And he said, three hours is too long, right? <laughs> you know, and I said, run out of that studio, you know, mm. like, that's just insane. Mm. Like, you know, uh, you be, we all know you're going to burn the vocalist out, right? You know, mm. we all know that, you know, that that's, that's no way to capture a great performance. You know, you'll fix that performance later on with, with plugins or something, mm. you know, but get, get the inspiration, capture it down. And that's where the pick a format and get to work. Who cares what the mic is, you know, mm. uh, everybody's got those stories of like, you know, you, you know, you get working on a guitar part or something and you walk out to the studio after the parts, after you finished tracking it and everybody's just loving the sound and you walk out and you see the microphone laying on the floor because it fell out of the, the stand. Right. And it's just mm. like, Oh my God, you know, that's amazing. How did that happen? Right. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I'm curious in your hierarchy of singer, lyric, melody, groove, gear. Um, why why is lyric above melody in your perspective? Um, I it just I, maybe that's mostly for me, but you, mm. you're there. 
pretty tightly, you know, held together. Mm. I think it's more just that the singer is, and, and you know, we're talking about certain classic things. You know, you know, I mean, we're not necessarily talking about a punk record, you know, per mm. se, um, but like on a on a pop or a you know or a rock record, you know, how many times engineers have you know you you record the band and you know you're putting all the instruments down and it's time to do the vocals and the vocal step vocalist steps up and he starts singing and you go okay this one's not going anywhere you know mm. because the singer's just not there but then you get a professional you know you get a great singer on a mediocre song and suddenly the song is just jumping you know mm. so you know that's just I, I would have to say that that list is just what i've found to be successful you know and those mm. those songs you know that that last i think melody is extremely important and it's more important than groove and it's more important than the gear mm. but i don't i kind of put lyric as number two mm. yeah. fair enough yeah yeah i'm curious um going back to one of the previous questions about what you would recommend uh, to a bedroom producer who wants to step up their quality a bit. And you talked about using outboard gear. Um, I know a lot of outboard gear that is worthwhile. It can be super expensive. And so I wonder if, uh, if someone either can't afford outboard gear or they can only afford like, one thing to focus on do you have like oh a preamp is like the best first piece of outboard gear or something like that i, I think instruments instruments <laughs> instruments yeah mm. you know i mean that's where the source comes from i think you know um the best studios that i've ever worked in you know they have great toys mm. right you know it's like wow what is this is a harpsichord oh my god i've never played a harpsichord you know mm. it's like you know and you have somebody who's used to playing piano sit down and play a harpsichord they, they you know they, all kinds of things rush through their mind right. so it, again it doesn't matter therefore what compressor or what microphone mm. it mattered with the instrument you know i i think that's the most important thing in, in a studio even if it's a bedroom studio you know it's like you know i like here we have like we have a mandolin we have a banjo i think the banjo we maybe spent 40 bucks in in a you know in a, a salvation army or something that we bought you know it's just like it doesn't have to be a great instrument but just more instruments for for inspiration I know that's probably not the answer you want to hear, right? I mean, it's like you'd like to know, like, oh, you know, what's a really great mic is that, you know, that uh, Audio Techniques something or whatever, yeah. you know. But I just, I really don't think that those things are as important as, you know, the stuff that matters, the inspiration, mm. the song, the lyric, you know, the melody, you know. Mm. That's the stuff that makes people pay attention. You know, don't, I don't forsake the gear, obviously, you know, I'm surrounded by very expensive gear, you know, and, and we have some very expensive microphones too. And they're awesome. And you, we use them all the time. We don't like take the C12 down and say, nah, work on a 57, you know, but mm. yet, you know, there are times when the 57 is the better choice, right? It's mm. just, you know, it, it's, it's about how choices is an interesting option too. I think, you know, you, you have to keep your options to a few, not 90 different microphones. I've seen singers step up to, you know, 10 different microphones, you know, and mm. wonder which one's best, you know, it's like, you know what, get a large capsule condenser, a vintage tube, you know, maybe a dynamic mic, you know, you should have your bases covered there. You don't need to sing into 10 mics to see which one's best. I think you could probably pick three or four. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's that falls into that same philosophy of the singer being the most important thing. But in this case, the instrument becomes the singer rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. focusing on the plugins. Yeah. yeah and I mean, uh, you know, if, it's also, I think, the best thing to consider as an artist, even a, especially a bedroom, you know, producer, you know, creator, is that you have all the things you need. Mm. You have them there. It's all you all you need mm. is yourself. 
Mm. You know, you don't, that's the great leveling plane of the DAW. And, you know, you know, we've mastered, I don't know, probably hundreds of records that were recorded in garage band and there, and some of them are amazing and some of them mm. are awful, <laughs> but it's not garage band. That's making that decision. Mm. It's the content that goes on it, you know, that's, oh. and that's, that's the best part. That's really the best part. The only thing I, 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 and I've said this a couple of times too recently is that I feel that people are missing the analog experience that mm. it's actually really hard for people these days to actually hear what an analog recording sounds like, you know, even mm. in vinyl, like so many, you know, somebody, somebody who's got, I'll say plenty of money to buy, you know, a decent turntable setup just said to me, well, I'm thinking about getting a USB turntable because it's, you know, it's just so much more convenient. It's like, okay, so I like the convenience factor because we want people to enjoy music no matter how that happens, right? We don't want you to have to work at your enjoyment, really, you know, mm. unless you're an engineer. But, um, you know, it's like it's getting rare that people actually have a turntable hooked up into a phono stage on an on an analog receiver that's just all like analog right or mm. a mixing board like if some you know if 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 you're recording something and you take your microphone and you plug it into your mic pre is the mic pre in the interface and does it have to in order for you to hear it back in your headphones does it have to go through digital mm. you know like like how many people actually hear, and that's one of the things we used to do at the, the with the analog mixing room was we have an EMT plate reverb, and so you know listening to a full on all analog processed recording, and suddenly like you realize like wow I don't need that just that little bit of reverb goes a real long way in analog because there's just so many more places for you know, those fine tuned micro harmonics and micro dynamic things to find a place and to build richness and thickness mm. or edge and bite, you know, it, it's, it's, I think analog is often thought of as being, you know, warm, but I think it's mm. more about resolving, you know, it's like, how you know, can you take, you know, you know, four tracks of edgy biting guitars and, and hear distinctly, what's going on with all of them you know hmm. yeah is that is that due to the analog resolution that there's more places for things to fit I, into i think at the higher at the higher harmonic area yes absolutely hmm. when you know what i think digital can capture pure low frequency sine waves pretty easily because you know they're they're so long right but as mm. you start thinking about the difference between the harmonics in the 6 8 10k range you start get limiting where you can put them and so if it's really supposed to fall somewhere in between where that sample can put it is it really accurate you mm. know so can we talk about tape machines for a second because I'm kind of obsessed with them, even though I've never used one. And I noticed that almost all of my favorite records were recorded to tape um, because I, my friend a few years ago was like, yo, you need to take a deep dive into 60s music. And I immersed myself and fell in love with those era 60s, 70s, soul, R&B, rock, yeah. all that stuff. Um, and is tape the highest resolution recording medium that we have access to right now um when we think about resolution we're thinking of frequency response we're thinking of dynamic range mm. and maybe you know dynamic range related to noise floor right mm. um in most all of the measurement specifications digital just blows the marks off of analog mm. you know in terms of accuracy of frequency response you know extended frequency response 
mm-hmm. dynamic range, it's it's a it's, it's no contest. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. 144 dB of dynamic range for 24 bit versus 70. You know, 70 versus 144. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? But but it's more about how we abuse the things that we do in digital versus what we don't abuse in analog. And I think the analog there, when you're mixing, yeah, the mixing, the sampling rate is, you know, in the, or beyond the millions, right? So there's, there's way more places to store all that information and find the clarity in my, that's, that's what I, that's what I hear. That's what I feel. That's what I experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why when, when we even invite people to sit down, you know, if they don't have a something in an analog source, you know, we've got hundreds of two inch tapes here, you know, put on a two inch tape. We, we do it. We do transfers for people all the time. And, you know, and so put the two inch, put the tape on while we're doing the transfer. It's also playing back through the monitoring, you know, and we can switch it between, you know, the analog source or the return from, you know, from Pro Tools. And there's just no doubt about it. Everybody says that it just, it's so much easier to mix that true source coming from the tape than it is from the resampled, you know, source coming back from digital. Mm. Why is that? I don't know. And that doesn't mean you throw digital away. I Mm. think the, it's, it's a hybrid world, right? I mean, that, that would probably be the best choice is to have the best of all the options available. Like I said, I grew up on that Neve console and I was, I was a little naive when I first started working on it, you know, but then I started recognizing that what I was working on was sounding awesome. So I figured it had to do, since I was so young, it probably had something more to do with the console than me, mm. but then as I left the Neve, because the there was no automation, it was just nearly, imp- you know, ha- you know, and gates were like bad, you know, analog, you know, noise gates or, you know, gates that would like keep the snare drum bleed out of the toms, right? Uh, it, they worked really, you know, poorly. So you'd, you know, you'd go when I, there are many times we would do spot erasing to get rid of all of the audio on the Tom tracks with the exception of the Toms. And so you'd take the tape out of the cap stand, you know, and you'd, and you'd literally pull the tape across the erase head slowly and find your grease pencil mark. And there you go. You got the things you did because you didn't have the automation to turn them on and off, right? And then, or we'd bounce them to another set of tracks. We'd record the toms on, you know, maybe three tracks, one one mm-hmm. for each. And then we'd ba- later on, as you got maybe halfway through the production, you'd bounce the toms down, manually turning them on and off, so that you wind up with a stereo pair that were nice and clean. <laughs> I mean, that's what you had to do to make it work if you didn't have automation. So as soon as as soon as we had automation, it was just like, oh my God, you know, my your mixes are better. I mean, the sound of the individual instruments wasn't better, but the balancing was better. You know, you mm. had more time to concentrate on the production rather than the gear. Yeah. So that makes sense. I think sa- sadly it does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that you know that. <laughs> Total recall is pretty amazing, you know, mm. and but committing is amazing, mm. you know, and, and you know, I mean, that's kind of the lesson that is always so amazing when you think about like Sgt. Pepper or Pet Sounds or you know, or mm-hmm. those kinds of albums when it's just like what they had to commit to on the spot mm. to make it happen. And then that's that whole option paralysis thing. If you if you if you're constantly able to go back and adjust, you know, your vocal harmony levels, you're not concentrating on the job at hand. Mm. And so, I think start committing. You know, and we used to say, you know, we used to do that all the time with two inch tape, and it's a process you learn. When again, like I, we don't, I don't really record a whole lot, but we do record some albums. Um, and um, I'm in destructive record mm. I, almost all the time. Like, mm. why? Just, why? Because I'm old school and I like, no, it's because I don't want options. It's, here it is. This is it. 
we, you know, it's like, let's, let's get it right. Let's just have it done. There it is. It's on that track. That's the only guitar part. Don't tell, don't ask me later to find another one. Wow. That's not what I, you know, I mean, I suppose that, that there's a lot of, you know, people that would disagree and say, yeah, but it's just hard drive space. What's the problem? You know, if you can actually just re keep recording and find the track and then forget that they're there and not go back, then that would be great. But I, I know too many people that like keep flipping back and going back and, you know. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. I, I was going to ask you, uh, given that we do have infinite retake ability, how can we create the environment for ourselves in a digital world where we we have to commit? And I think destructive record is something that I imagine every DAW has. So that's a <laughs> right, it's a great yeah. option right there. And also maybe limit your tr you limit the tracks. You know, mm. I mean, I, I don't know. It's like I think again, it's because it's there and you can, you do, right? But does it need it, right? And and that's part part of the role of the producer. And and I think, you know, we all get enamored by being able to add the kitchen sink into the production. And we, you know, because we forgot that it was just about the song and the lyric and the melody, right? That's mm. what it, that's what is most important, right? Then it's groove, and that's all those other things. But if if you know, if you strip it down to just, you know, and like I, a lot of times when I'm recording vocals, um, you know, because we have, you know, the analog board, whatever, but, you know, I'll set up a separate stereo mix to listen through on, you know, on Oratone speakers, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, we'll get, get the sound on, you know, the main speakers, you know, again, not long, couple, maybe a pass or two or whatever. And then as we're going through the performance and doing takes or something, I'm normally in mono on an oratone and listening to a separate independent mix, which is mostly vocal, maybe like snare and kick, and then some instrumentation for harmonic content, you know, but stripping everything else away and just, mm. just listening to what matters right there. Mm. Yeah, Sim simple stuff, you know, that just, you know, it's time. And then, you know, that brings an interesting point, too, as as we take on a new intern tomorrow. Um, it's really a drag that like studios have all closed because that's where many people learned the processes. Right. Mm. And I used to not necessarily embrace, you know, not not necessarily podcasts or or interviews or whatever. I, I just always felt like, listen, you gotta be, you gotta be in the room. You know, you want to really experience, you want to, you want to understand it. You gotta be in the room, get, mm. you know, get a job as an intern. You can't anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's really hard, you know, mm. to find a studio first off, find a studio that's competent, maybe, you know, that will allow, allow you to come in. It's hard, mm. you know? So. Yeah. 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 When I told, uh, when I told my dad that I was going to be interviewing you, he was like, you should go get an internship at the studio. That sounds amazing. I was like, <laughs> he lives in New York, but you know, maybe. <laughs> maybe well, I mean, th th there's something to be said about that, you know? Mm. Um, and I always used to, you know, say to, a, you know, somebody starting off as an, as an, engineer that don't forego being an intern or an assistant because you learn by working with other people everybody wants to jump into the chair and just start mixing right away mm. and it's just like yeah but then you're missing out you're you're missing out on observing firsthand what everybody else is doing you know mm. and and i don't think it works in, in a lesson like you can't watch somebody you know eq a snare drum you know, you've got to feel it out. You got to see where the mic is placed. You got to hear how the drummer is hitting it and experience that multiple times, you know, um, mm. and experience it with different engineers, different drummers, you know, and, and kind of get that whole sense. But again, it's, I understand that it's hard to do that these days and that's, that's upsetting. Mm. But the beautiful thing is, is that you have the, you have more power in your bedroom studios, everyone, than, you know, the Beatles had in making Sergeant Pepper. So pick that's a format wild. and get to work, just do it. Wow. You know, it's like, that's, mm. that's really incredible, you know? Mm. And, I, and I think that's another thing that I like to bring up to people is that 
what's most important is embracing your differences, not your similarities. Mm. You know, uh, most successful artists, you know, you'll, you'll have a lot of similarities to your genre. You know, you don't want to drift too far, you know? Um, oh no, I don't, you know, I can't use, you know, drum machine, I got to use live drums or, mm. you know, I got to use a live amp and not a amp simulator, or I don't do, I don't add harmonies because that's not, you know, that's all fine. But like, be different, embrace your differences. You know, that's what's going to make you an identifiable quality. Mm. And that's what people clue into. If you, you know, mm. uh, there was, there was a record we were doing, uh, somebody, needed a single done really fast for radio and the producer had said to me hey alan you know we just did that other record use that as a reference for this you know we don't even have time to check it we're just going you know <laughs> you're going to finish it and it's going right to this radio stations you know and so rose in our office she was a dj uh years ago and um so she came down to the studio while we were working on it and and she said and she heard me and i was kind of like a being it with that other project but she didn't realize that the other project was a different band and so she said oh well which one's the single and so i started playing it and she goes well they should use that other song because that's a much better song i said <laughs> but that's a different band <laughs> and she was just like really <laughs> you know um mm. You know, needless to say, mm. neither one of those bands have stuck around, you mm. know. So whereas, right. you know, you, you say LCD Sound System, Sufjan, you know, Ben Folds, you know, um, you know, uh, Dillinger Escape Plan, you know, um, you know, all the bands that were that have a sound, you know, that's they if you stick at it and you learn the rest of your craft well, that's mm. probably your best your best option. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to hone in on that point with you of of being original and being yourself and finding your own sound because it's one of the most thrown around terms and I understand why because it's so essential and so true and I know for myself I've often questioned when I hear people say that what does that actually mean in terms of like, what do I as a bedroom producer practically do in order to be original or find my sound? Like, how, how do you, how would you approach that or give advice to someone who is kind of lost at the idea of what that means in a practical sense? Um, you know, you, you can't have no influences, right? Mm. <laughs> you know, so you have to, you have to start there and just say, well, I'm influenced by, and I love their sound, right? That's how we all kind of get started doing what we're doing. Um, but I think it, it comes with practice that you have to learn to trust your feelings. And that, again, mm. that's a, you know, being original has to do, it has to a lot to do with trusting your own gut instincts, mm. you know, but I, but I think the whole nature of how we record now takes us away from that, you know, mm. like, like destructive record versus, you know, non-destructive recording. It's like, Oh no, you can be non-destructive. Ah, don't worry about the punch. We'll fix, you know, there's, you're not committing, you're, you know, you're not on the edge. You're not saying, I love that, you know, mm. um, you know, I, I just think it's a mindset that you get yourself into more than anything. It's, I don't know that it, I guess it's practiced too, right? I mean, if you can practice trusting your feelings and knowing that this is the sound that I'm going for, I mean, you can't be, I mean, you could be, um, you know, so introverted that you don't want to play it for anybody, but you just love the music that you make and that's fine. Hmm. But most people want to get it out into, you know, other people's, you know, enjoyment factor. And so you've got to take that in, into, into stride as well. You know, if, if you're going to write a song that, you know, takes seven minutes before the first lyric comes in, be prepared for a lot of people to not want to listen to that song, maybe, you know, hmm. but then there may be a niche that, loves that 
you know. And if mm. you love that, then believe in it and follow follow suit with it. Mm. Um, I I love that so much. And what you just said also points to why this podcast is both music oriented and self inquiry in oriented because what you just said of one of the keys to originality being trusting in your gut feelings and allowing yourself to express from that place that's inherently quite a um quite an introspective and uh almost spiritual concept of one has to have a certain level of like trust in themselves or self-awareness in order to be able to tune in and be like okay this is the feeling that wants to be expressed right now. And how can I become a channel for that feeling to become music? Um, But again, I think the digital age almost has taken us away from that feeling, you know, Mm. you know, you, you know, if you're writing an essay, if you're drawing a picture, if you're doing whatever, there's always the undo stages and there's always, you know, I can make a copy and save that one and redo it over on this one. Mm. You know, I I don't know. I don't know that that has really helped us, Mm. you know, as artists, you know, um, I, there's no going back and we do make great art still. It's not like, you know, everything sucks. I just think, Mm you have to be able to maybe practice some of those skills. You know, um, there was a great thing we did once um, with a group. Um, this is with this group, the Whirling Dervishes that I used to produce. And they were getting uh, looked at by Capitol Records and they wanted to hear some more material, more songs. Um, now, they the band had spent a lot of time making, you know, good polished demos, but the label just wanted to hear the songs. So they had come to me, they were like, I don't listen, like we have this very limited budget, we have this very limited time, but we've got to bang these songs out. Can we do it? And I was just like, well, we can, but you guys always want to, you know, pick apart your parts. And da, da, da. Yeah. I, said, I said, the only way we're going to be able to do this is if everybody just agrees, we're going to do it live. Like, let's just record it live and then mix it. And they were like, Alan, you know, we're not that good. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, maybe no punching in Mm. and they were like okay well that's fair and so we wound up recording like four songs in one day which was you know all the parts for the band including vocals and the the rule was just kind of like listen you know when we listen back to the live performance if you liked what you did let's keep it but if you didn't you're gonna have to redo the whole take Hmm. because back in those days on recording to two inch, you know, you, you know, you'd have to go back. All right, let me find the endpoint. point. Um, where are we pulling it? Where are we punching out? You know, it just takes time. And hmm. then you've got to, you know, listen for the performance. Did it match? Did it not match? So we just, we had said to do that and we got through really quickly. And even when it came time for the mix, it was just like no automation. They, they said to me like, no, cause the automation just takes longer. They were hmm. like, we're just all have our hands on the board, you know, hmm. And we committed and we did it. And still to this day, those are some of the finest songs that the band actually ever recorded. Wow. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know that it was genius. You know, it was more, I guess, you know, in the spur of the moment, that's what had to happen. But how many times do, you know, I don't know, do you accidentally put up the reference vocal instead of the finished vocal and go, God, that has great attitude, right? Or something, Mm. you know. And it's hard to remember those things, you know, that's the stuff that you learn from being in the studios around watching those mistakes happen. I mean, my, my best thing I can say is just trust your feelings. Really. That's, I think that's the one thing that we've, we've learned not to do. And it's the thing you need to learn most to do. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Honestly, um, I really resonate with that. And because, because recording is kind of, you know, soul searching metaphysical, Mm -hmm. you know, um, we were doing, we were, you know, we were doing a session one time and, and there was another session going on and there was an extremely, extremely famous guitarist that was working in the studio in between when we were there. And so the assistant said, oh, yeah, well, there's his guitar right over there. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And so the guitarist in the other band was just like, can I play it? And the system was like, yeah, you know, I played it, you know, whatever. And, you know, and, you know, the guy was just like, he was just playing it like what's with such like, you know, I don't know, just magic, like in something, you know, and how can that happen? It's just, we're just energy and information, right? I mean, we're, mm. you know, I mean, sure, we're electrons and neutrons and protons, but I mean, even beyond that, right? It's, there's nothing there. How can, mm. how can that guitar make that guitar player play better? Mm. It had to be something metaphysical, mm. you know, emotional something mm. about that made him feel like he was playing very special mm. can't ignore that stuff can't ignore that stuff you know mm. yeah uh, one of the questions i had prepared for you was for for the aspiring artist who wants to you know make it in the music industry and make music their full-time profession and mm, be big or be successful, whatever that means to them. Um, what would your, what would your advice be to that person? And it, it sounds like what we just talked about is a big, possibly the number one piece of advice, but I would love to hear if there's anything else that comes to mind. Well, I think you have to, you know, you have to be humble enough to say, I don't know everything. I think there's, there is a huge, you know, in, um, opportunity to just start doing everything on your own right mm. like you know if even if you can play drums kind of well you know but yeah but i got beat detective i can you know i can fix it you know well maybe maybe not you know maybe you should experience working with a drummer you know um maybe i think there's a lot of that kind of stuff that because it's so affordable and so easy to access mixing total automation you know total recall you know mic modeling tech techniques etc you know maybe we're maybe you jump too fast you know maybe you should go to the four track maybe that you know actually that might be a really great software would mm. be like a four track software box, mm. right? Like, at, you, okay, here you are. You got what the Beatles have and you have two of them. So you can bounce them back and forth, Yeah, but that's it, you know, and wow. you have, and you had, you would have to commit to it. I don't know, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> saying that like, I know that our minds play so much into things. And when you have, when you have a deadline and it has to be done, or you only have certain tracks, you know, when a singer knows that like, listen, I only, there's only two tracks here, folks, you know, we can do one take and then we can try another, but we're going to have to lose one of these at some point. Right. Or something like that. Mm. Everybody's a little more on edge or a little more on fire. Like, okay, let's, all right, let's go for it. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to get this, but I'm going to get it better. I, rather than like auto tuning or something. You know? Right. And, and there's, you, you're missing that excitement, missing that emotion. And I wish that people could experience that more. I mean, you know, there's some great documentaries too. Right. I mean, there's that where people, you know, you see some older footage like that, you know, and um, work the the wrecking crew i think is a, is a really really great video of a you know a section that just you know always used to nail and they would just play together all the time you know mm. yeah i do i do love that idea for like a four track da or eight track da that if there are any software engineers listening <laughs> who yeah, are entrepreneurial right? make it yeah, happen just, you know that'd be sweet and, you know, it's almost like they started coming out with, I forget what they were called. They were like mini vinyl records, right? That were coming out. It was like, it was more like a, a marketing gimmick, I think. Mm. Maybe it was like two and a half years ago or something through the holiday season. And, and you know, you the discs were only about maybe three inches or so. Mm. And you had to buy this like $100 playback you know turntable mm. and it was and you you it kind of had a lid thing on it and and everybody it was all the rage and all all the you know all the indie labels had their top bands oh no you got a master for this just for this one format you know mm. 
and it was cool. You know, a lot of people bought into it, you know, but I don't know, maybe it'd be kind of interesting to do it with the door. I, I kind of like that idea. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, on the gear side, I just want to flip through like a couple of fastball questions where I just like toss uh, gear questions your way and you give uh, your two cents on, on what your favorite piece is in, in each situation. Okay. Um, yeah. We could we could think about it like maybe favorite in each category. So, do you have a, a favorite go to microphone? C twelve. C twelve, nice. Yeah, original nineteen fifty seven. Right on. And yeah. pre. Um, Jensen twin servos. Okay, never heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, they're extremely rare. Wow. Yeah. And um, how about compressor? uh la3a la3a yeah not a 2a but a 3a yeah yeah do you have a is there a different favorite compressor when it comes to acoustic guitar well i mean the, you know there's the um there's different types of compression you know optical la3a la2a optical devices t4 you know sensing circuit you know the cell mm -hmm. Um, there's Varimu, uh, you know, there's FET, you know, limiters, there's, you know, there's lots of different types of compression. So, um, you know, if it's a finger picking kind of, uh, guitar part, um, yeah, like, you know, uh, 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 having an optical compressor that has a variable attack and release is awesome, but they're not always readily available. So mm. a Varimu is awesome for that, you know. Mm. Um, so I think th that's the beauty of more, right? But like in, like in my control room, I have an optical, I have a Varimu, you know, I have an FET. Um, and that pretty much covers it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like there's not there's not a whole lot of, you know, opticals. I have other ones around, but my favorite one, I have two of, <laughs> mm. you know, just in case it breaks. So, you know. Nice. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Um, do you have uh, are you into guitar pedals at all? No, actually. But like I know the world is and I, I wish I could be, you know, um, but um, now, yeah, I mean, if I guess if my favorite ones would just be stuff that I've experienced over the course of years, but it mm. kind of, I know that there are so many others out. That's a big rage. I know going to the music store, you know, and you, and you go to the guitar section and you see this display case with like, you know, I don't know, hundreds of them, right? All. Mm -hmm different things with names that I have no idea what that pedal does, you know, mm -hmm. but that's awesome. <laughs> but that, but that also plays into the whole getting it at the source thing. Right. I mean, that's, mm. that's, what's beautiful about those is mm. that, you know, I remember recording a, a, a guitarist a couple of years ago for something and he had a pedal that, you know, like he would just, you know, hit something and then he turned himself into a keyboard player because he was down on the ground, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, and, you know, did it sound like a guitar? No. Did he sound like a keyboard player? No, but he was being inspired and, it, and it, mm. you know, and we wound up, you know, using a lot of that track in something, mm. you know, so that's the beauty of that, you know, and, and it was in a plug in, you know, uh, you know, it was mm. just inspired moment by turning knobs and feeling creative. So, mm. yeah, so I'm all in. So my favorite uh, stomp box is all of them. Nice. <laughs> yeah, so. Do you, uh, what about like effects units? Do you have a favorite multi effects or like a sneaky little secret weapon at the studio that you create cool effects with? Uh, well, we, we have the TC 6000s, which are pretty awesome. So mm. those reverbs are, are really great. Um, even Tide 4000, another classic great box, you know, mm -hmm. um, TC 2290, you know, but those are all replicatable in digital, you know. So mm. again, the box is a little bit different. I mean, um, from, a, from an analog world, I, I would say like we have a, I think it's a Dan Electro 
spring reverb mm. you know that like you know you plug your guitar into it and then you get out of it and then into an amp you know and it's just like okay that's awesome like so mm. whether and it's definitely a spring cheap reverb right mm. and so that's fun stuff but that plays back to that whole you just kind of have toys around for people to play mm. and you know rather than having 90 different presets of that reverb plugin, you know, rich hall, rich medium hall, rich long hall, you know, it's like, you know, the plate reverb has a, no I don't know if you're familiar, but it's, it has a knob, mm. right? And it's like between 0.3 and like five, like how long do you want it? You know, and, right. and that's it, you know, and then you perform based upon that. So. Wow. One thing that this all brings to mind too, and in the interaction between analog and digital is um, something that a lot of maybe bedroom producers don't consider, which is their digital to audio convert or digital to analog converters. And um, I'm curious if you have a strong opinion on that or any insight on like how important is that? How good are the the cheap units at doing that these days and and should we focus on upgrading that um i i it's there there it's very they're very important i think mm -hmm. you know the more complex the waveform the more important they are mm -hmm. um but again they're 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 less important than a lot of those things i i do have you know my favorites mm -hmm. but i don't know that they're necessarily the best mm. i mean i think they're the best you know the lavery <laughs> golds but i mean you know it's it it's a personal choice you know mm. and i know other people have other personal choices and there there is something about gear right as that like as you start exponentially spending more money mm. <laughs> you know sometimes those subtleties are more than subtle you know mm. and, and you go wow yeah that's 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 awesome. That's good. Mm. Right. Mm. You know, you can, you can hear, hear that. Um, mm. And that, that comes across in, in some mm. gear, you know, and, mm. and both, you know, the D to A side, because again, when, when people are, I mean, amps have D to A sometimes built into them, right? Some people use the powered amps and, you know, they'll take a digital input or something, mm. you know, and so now you're trusting the D to A inside, you know, your power amp, uh, inside your speaker cabinet mm. i i don't know that that's recommended you know maybe it's awesome because the cable you know the the signal the analog cable is short and it's more specifically designed for that unit you know for that speaker system to deliver a flatter response and i get all that but i wonder again going back how many people really get to hear analog you know how many people really get to hear you know what a you know a, a you know a good a really good vocal mic and a maybe acoustic guitar combination through good mic pre's coming back to a board with a analog compressor on them you know with maybe a little bit of spring reverb or plate reverb listening to all that as analog through an analog amp, you know, to analog speakers, you know, it's, I'm not trying to suggest that it's better, but I think it's something that people are losing track of hearing, which has to do a lot with resolution and depth and how and why, you know, I would always find that when digital first started having the ability to mix in digital, I would always find that I would be adding more reverb to my digital mixes than the analog mixes, because I think the detail in all the harmonic, the micro harmonic, micro dynamic stuff that happens in analog gives me the sensation that I'm looking for without having to add the reverb, mm. but maybe that it's stripped away in digital. And so therefore I want to find what I'm missing. Mm -hmm. And so then I was finding that I was adding more reverb than mm. necessary. Mm. Yeah. So if, um, if someone 
already has like their instruments in order, like they've got everything they need in that regard and they want to start taking a step from being all digital to a more analog sound, what would you recommend as like the first step after an instrument in terms of gear to move towards that vibe? Um, well, I think there's been incredible advances in microphones, analog microphones recently, you know, mm. uh, I mean, you know, whereas I think, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, you either had the high end mics or not. Mm. Um, but I think there's a lot of really great, you know, four five, six hundred $600 microphones, you know, that sound pretty awesome. You know, I think the technology and manufacturing has is really nailed that. Mm. Um, I think also the same is true of mic pre's. You know, I think that um, we've got some really decent mic pre's at affordable budget levels. You know, um, don't just trust. You know, if your if your interface has mic inputs, don't just trust those. You know. You could probably, and also the vin. I don't want to say the vintage market, but the used market, right? I mean, mm. you know, there's there's plenty, plenty of very affordable, you know, analog boards that could be used like as a just for loading in things and getting character, you know, um, mm. you know, even the, the I, I, somebody that I don't know that was making a record, they were just like, "Have you ever heard the Mackie Onyx mic pre's?" And I was like, "Yeah." And they were like, yeah, they're awesome. And it's just like, wow, like, you know, 10 years ago, I don't know that people would have been saying that, but maybe now it's, you know, they're like recognizing like, wow, yeah, even that basic jump from a basic, you know, input, just taking a mic pre into a interface versus using an out an outboard Mackie board to get at your mic pre level up you know, and noticing the difference. There's a lot to be said about, you know, just going back and just trying stuff that you thought maybe wasn't happening at the time, but now it's kind of cool, right? Mm. I can I could think of a lot of gear. I, you know, I think, I don't know if, I think we threw away a Fairchild mixer, a Fairchild <laughs> board. Yeah, yeah. Um, somebody had, somebody had bought a four track quarter inch reel to reel machine. And it came with like a little field Fairchild mixer. Mm -hmm. And so the guy gave it to me and I, you know, I just never had the chance to try it. And at some point it was just like, all right, well, we can't keep all this gear. We got to get rid of some of it. Mm -hmm. We don't really need that. Let's just get rid of it. And I think we put it out in junk week, you know, and now in hindsight, that was probably, you know, one of the stupidest moves, <laughs> you know, I could probably could have done, but mm. it just was because I wasn't thinking about just plugging into, you know, we were thinking Neve consoles and, mm. you know, and, and SSL board consoles and Trident consoles, you know, we weren't mm. thinking of like this portable, you know, Fairchild mixer couldn't possibly have sounded awesome. You know, mm. we won't know. I threw it away. Right. Well, I, I do want to be cognizant of your time because I know it's late in uh, the East Coast. But um, since since you mentioned that the singer and I assume overall, like the song, the songwriting, you would say is the most important part of the quality of a piece of music. Um, I'm curious if you have any advice for people on the songwriting front of uh, what it, what is it that they can do to really improve their songwriting and and take their songs to the next level from the most fundamental stage. Um, I mean, the first thing I want to say is just you know don't try and fix it, just finish it. Mm. You know, I think a lot of people get caught up in like, you know, okay, I've got this song and I start writing it down, you know, and, and I, the, it just never gets completed because it, they're all, it's always in a state of being fixed, you know, or, or I've got to make this better. I've got to make this better. Whereas I think mm. if you just 
do it, finish it, put it out, you know, put mm-hmm. it on the shelf. Even if you don't, if you don't feel it's just finish it. I just so many times, you know, I'll, I'll, and I'll hear it from people. Somebody played me the other day. One of my assistants played me. They were like, Alan, can you take a listen to this song? And I was like, yeah, okay, great. So the, you know, dropped the wave for I'm on our desk, my desktop and I started playing it and, and there was no vocal. I was like, oh, I said, it sounds like there should be a vocal in here. Oh yeah, we're going to put the vocal in, but what do you think of it? You know, <laughs> you know, and my response was they, they know what to expect of me. It was like, well, where's the vocal, you know? And it's not to say that I don't respect instrumental or that, you know, everything needs to have a vocal every moment of the song. It's more just like, that's a lot of the world that we live in, right? I mean, as as songwriters, as you know, as storytellers, the vocal has a big important factor on it. And I just I I see people struggle for you know years on six songs, right? Because they're mm. constantly fine tuning it and fix. Just finish it. Just finish it and move on. Finish it and move on. And I think that practice gets you in the habit of trusting your feelings, you know, Mm. being, being true to what your, your art form is rather than chasing. There, there was an artist we worked with once and on the same piece of two inch tape, the song existed like in three versions. It was like a jazz version, adult contemporary version and a rock because he couldn't make up his mind. And we kept re, you know, revisiting the song, you know, just Mm. finish it, move on, you know, just, I don't know, just, seems so easy to do it but so many people just get so paralyzed into not being able to do that you know yeah i think like people myself included i come to a place where i if i start writing something that i think is good i'll i'll be afraid to mess it up once i'm about 60 (laughs) percent into it so i'm like oh shit how, how do i like make sure that this stays as good as it has started and then I'll overthink it or I'll judge it too early because when I'm about 30% in, I'll say, oh, these lyrics are trash or this beat is too robotic or something like that. And then I won't want to take it to fruition. Um, do you have anything, do you have anything to sort of say to those phenomenon? I just, I just think maybe it goes a little in the metaphysical, you know, man, I guess like, you know, life is short or whatever, (laughs) you know, like, you know, don't, uh, Charles will kill me for this, but like the Wrens, I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They were a pitchfork, you know, love these guys. And they put out a record, uh, the Meadowlands. It was, you know, pretty iconic at the time. And, you know, but they, they, I think this last record, they've been mixing and then sending me for mastering for four years, <laughs> you wow. know, something like that. And I, I know that that's not just private information. It's like, you know, I know Charles has been playing things for people and whatever, you know, they happen to make amazing music. So maybe for Charles, that's what works, right? That's, right. Th- that's his path. And that's what his perfection is. Whereas Sufjan just, you know, said, you know, this, this version isn't working. I'm going to start again. And just, you know, and then realized how educational that was and put out, you know, Avalanche, which was a lot of really awesome different versions of those same songs, mm. you know? Wow. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I would just say, you know, commit that, that, that's the big thing. And so, so hard to do in digital, but yet so easy to do an analog. So maybe have an analog mindset while you're, working in digital Mm. all right cool well i'm gonna ask you one question once we stop recording but for now for everyone listening i want to just say thank you so much for taking the time to answer all these questions and share your wisdom and um it's been really insightful for me and hopefully it is insightful for some up-and-coming aspiring music artists and nerds as well (laughs) <laughs> I mean, you know, listen, I get surprised, you know, I, I, I love giving out information and then learning from the information too, you know, like hearing what people do with stuff, you know, and, mm. you know, like, like, let's hope that somebody makes a four track DAW. Nice. That would, that would be really awesome. You know, that maybe, is awesome. maybe this was the inspiration. Right. Boom. Yeah. Cool. Thanks cool. for having me. 
Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Blue School Spaces podcast. Here are my three key takeaways from this conversation with Alan. Number one is a practical way to make more original sounding music and art in general is to trust your gut instinct and create your music from that place of trust. One thing that Alan mentioned was that getting songs done and moving on to the next thing is a great way to build that trust in yourself. Key takeaway number two is the quote from Alan where he said, the more options you have, the less artistic you will be. This is pretty self-explanatory, but when we have too many options, we become paralyzed by not knowing what to choose, where if we only have a few things that we can do, we start to take action. And so we can do things like destructively record in our DAWs so that every previous take gets deleted, or we can do things like choosing to limit the amount of tracks that we use in a given project, such as maybe make a song using only four tracks or eight tracks and see what comes out of it. Creating intentional limitation for yourself will help your artistry blossom more and more. Key takeaway number three is Alan's famous quote, pick a medium and get to work. I love how much Alan emphasized the importance of committing, finishing projects and moving on. And that fits in perfectly with that saying, pick a medium and get to work, because he's basically saying, don't overthink things too much. You know, work with what you have, pick a medium based on what is available to you and get to work. As we remember in his hierarchy of important things when it comes to music, gear was in last place. So it really is more about our lyrics, our melodies, our ideas, our performance, and that will translate onto any medium. So pick a medium, get to work. As the quantity of completed songs flows, then quality will be born and the gear will naturally come to us in that process. So I love that. Pick a medium and get to work. That's one I need to really work on for myself and hope that that resonates with you guys too. So thank you once again for tuning in to this podcast. I'm really grateful to you listening for being on this journey with me of exploring the secrets of music and self-development, self-inquiry. And yeah, I'm really grateful to continue this journey and keep exploring. So thank you so much for being here, supporting and offering your positive energy and i'll see you again very soon in the next episode of blue school spaces peace